Hello, I'm Carl and today I'm going to give you an overview of how to make your own level editor for your video game. Uh, I'll be going through these uh, points or topics on the right here. And I will both show sort of some visual stuff within the editor in my game, but then also show some code where the code will be in Odin programming language. So let's start off with the first topic here editing modes so i have here my game running and if i press f2 at any point while my game is running it jumps into the editor where i can pan around and play stuff play stuff such as tiles like this and i can go in here and place entities and stuff and these are the different editing modes of the editor so this mode here is you select a tile or a bunch of tiles and then you can paint and uh, the place tile uh, entities editing mode is uh, for placing more complicated things such as the player character or different NPCs and stuff. So the, you see the player character is this one and it can be placed using this tool. And these are sort of different editing modes. Then there's a few more here I have for like, uh, you, I can click on entities and find some properties and I can do like a big bulk selection. So the way this is structured in code, just this general idea of having different editing modes within the editor is that uh, inside my editor, I have something called the editor memory, which is sort of the global state of the editor. And that one has something called an edit mode. If we go to edit mode, then this is a union of a bunch of different uh, edit modes these are pointers right now here but they don't really have to be that's just an implementation detail and if we go into for example one of these such as edit mode place tiles then this has a bunch of state and this is the state for the edit mode while we are in this mode and placing tiles and it has stuff like a uh, brush tile is the selected tile that will be painted next and then I can have a multi-selection of tiles in here. You see, I can, they're just like this border on here. Uh, now I have five different tiles selected, so it will randomize between them. And then there's some other stuff, like uh, I can, I can uh, flip tiles in the editor by pressing X, then it flips them, and it remembers that state. So the editor needs to, some way to remember which am I, which way do I want to flip the the next the painted tile and stuff so you have that state in there and then you have the other editing mode for placing entities where you have like which entity type are we placing so you have a selected type in here which is this thing and then you have some more state and then we can look at where this editing mode is used which uh, which is here um here we switch on the current editing mode and this is the one we just looked at place style. So if, if this edit mode, this is a union, like I showed. So if this one is like, uh, has the, is in the place tiles value right now, then it runs this function. If it's in the place entities value right now, then it runs this function. Uh, and this uses the Odin, uh, uh, the Odin unions, which can both, we can both switch on the type, but you also have the value of the current uh, variant that like M inside this case, M will be of this type. Uh, so you don't have to have an enum plus a raw union like in C, for example. Um, so in the case of place tiles, then it will run this function, which draws this stuff, this this is the toolbar on the side here. Well, this is place entities. This stuff, it draws this stuff, this toolbar on the side. And that's just, this code is responsible for drawing everything that's not the top toolbar, right? So you have, for example, this uh, here is, um, that's the toolbar on the side. It goes through all the different tiles and draws them and stuff. But actually, my editing modes do not draw the game world at all. When I have an empty editing mode, um, 
then like this one, for example, entity types editing mode doesn't draw the world because in here you define a new entity types. So none of these editing modes draw the world by default. So I have a function for drawing the editor world. So you have like, um, I think it's at the bottom here somewhere. Um, yeah, here, edit mode draw world. So the the uh, place tiles function uses that one. Place tile function uses edit mode draw world. And this is probably the place entities, which is quite big. Yeah, place entities uses it. So all these functions just, what, what, what they get is, um, what all these function get is just like which rect, because this uses an immediate mode UI. So they just get like a rectangle and the current editing mode plus the global editor memory. But it just needs to know where can I draw and what is my state? And then it does stuff. So the next point here is called UX, how far to take it. UX means user experience and with this we mean like how well does the editor behave, you know, when a user starts a program, maybe they're used to certain kinds of workflows working similarly in all programs and they want a certain level of user friendliness. And how far do you take that? Now, the first thing you should keep in mind is that uh, when people make, like I'm making my game and it's having a very specific editor, I'm not making a general purpose game engine, right? The moment you make a general purpose game engine, that means your tools must be able to do a much wider variety of things. And also since it's not just you using it, it's anyone, then the UX must be, you can't cut corners, right? And that's sort of where I want to go with this is that for me, uh, the important UX part when it's only me using it is that I'm not, I don't feel like I have to fight with the tool. So I have, like for example, I have these, uh, uh, I have different uh, this UI here with all these buttons and stuff, and they would they they work mostly like you would uh, think they do. Like you can click them, and when you release, that's actually when it's clicked. You know these small details. I've tried to fix that. What I don't have, for example, there's no there's no concept of you can't like you know use tab to jump between controls. You know with keyboard focus. Um, which is something that I would expect in a general purpose editor. But since I'm not making that, then I can cut the corner because I don't tend to use the keyboard focus. But if I had a single other person on my team, then I would probably have to add that. Or at least, you know, if we were, we were just a few people, then I would have to add it. So how, how your UX is uh, depends a lot on how many people is on the team and but, but the important part is that the people on the team don't feel stopped by it. But I can implement anything I want in here when, 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 when I get annoyed by it. But, you know, if you have a level designer, they, they, they're just probably going to be fine and grumble on their own. Uh, so you have to be aware of uh, what's a good minimum standard. And I would say, like, uh, UIs working like in other programs with all the how the buttons behave. Um, for example, I think it's quite important that when you click a button that you can go outside and release and then it does nothing. Small stuff like that. People expect that. And then to have the keyboard focus if anyone else is going to use the editor. I also think the editor should be responsive. I mean, it should just because it's an even when you use it yourself, you just try to make sure it performs okay so you so, so it's not like micro annoyances when you work with it, right? If you're making an editor for your own game, then, uh, like I said, uh, it's you don't have to implement all the funny things like in a general purpose game engine. And actually, in a general purpose game engine, uh, the tools 
take much longer to develop than any fancy, you know, rendering code and stuff. The bulk of the work in a general purpose game engine is making tools. That's, that's the majority of the time. Well, it's the biggest single thing. And getting the UX nice and having all the features in there, that's a hell lot of work. So that's why game engines, one reason why game engines um, take such a long time to build because you have to have such nice tools because a game engine is only as good as your tools. So in that case, you really need to take UX very far and you need to be ready that you're going to spend a lot of time on that. But when you're making it just for yourself like this, then you can cut all kinds of funny corner as long as you're happy with it and it doesn't feel like it stops you, then you can just skip uh, UX things that you would normally expect to see in a general purpose commercial application. But keep in mind that this editor I only use for me. Uh, I mean, I, I use it for when I'm making the game. If I would be shipping this editor as part of the game, you know, as a level editor, for example, in many racing games, you have level editors where you can make tracks. Then the UX needs to be as good as the rest of the game, of course. I mean, games are known for having, they, they need to be very user friendly. So if it's a like gamer facing level editor, well, then you really need to step up your UX. But when it's just internal tools, then you can take it a bit more easy and do whatever is needed for you. So the next point on here is undo and it says different approaches. So I actually have a separate video on how I implement undo in my editor. So this section will be brief. I will link that video in the description of this one. So how I currently do it is that each time I do an action like this, I painted these three tiles up here and I press undo and I can press redo, like I can do this, like that, and then redo. Each time it does a single action, it takes the whole state of the game, serializes it and puts it on a stack. So it's something like record undo, this function here, serializes the whole world and then takes this serialized state and throws it on a stack, right? And this stack is just, uh, where is it? Here. So these are just a stack of serialized state and whenever I undo it deserializes this state and replaces the whole editor state, the whole editor world with that. Which might sound slow or something, uh, but in case of a simple game like this is actually fast enough. This is probably the biggest level I will have in my game and this undo is mostly instant. If you have a bigger game then this is um, maybe not the best idea, uh, but this whole approach is based on uh, the people that who make the game tear down. Uh, who uh, was he called? Voxa Dennis Gustafsson uh, has talked about this, and he has used this method in his previous games. He also uses uses it in tear down. I asked him if it's because tear down is much more complicated than his previous game, and I asked him on Twitter if it's. Uh, works as well in Teardown as in his previous games and he said that in Teardown it's actually starting to become a bit of a problem this method because it's a big complicated game so they have to do some optimizations of this under technique so that that's sort of a good benchmark of when it starts being troublesome it's a no well that's a first person you know 3d voxel game which is a lot more stuff than in this um, so if you can't do undo by serializing the whole state uh, and stuff. Then uh, the other approach is usually one of the other approaches is to do sort of a command. People call it the command pattern or whatever. So it's essentially something like a, a, you have a, a command is a struct or something. And the command contains something like perform, which is sort of a procedure that takes some args and then it's an unperform. I don't know what to call this. I don't remember. <laughs> uh, I mean, this is, you have to put something in it, right? But the, the idea here is that then you have, 
your undo stack is just a stack of these commands, and then it knows how to it knows how to make an action. It knows how to reverse an action, right? Uh, but the annoying thing about doing this is that whenever you do anything in your editor, you have to make one of these commands and make sure that it works correctly in both ways. The uh, method I use with the whole serializing the whole state, I don't need to ever care about commands. I just whenever I make an action, after the action is done, I serialize the whole state and put it on a stack. Anything at any point where I just do this record undo, you can see like yeah, here I place an entity. So I place I create an entity, I put the position, add it to the entities list, and then I do record undo. I never and this will have all the changes between the last time I recorded undo and this one, you know. But in the command case, you would have to make one of these for each action, and it needs to be like separate. So the whole code code flow, you know, sort of becomes a bit more complicated. The third option for undo is to have a very sophisticated data model, where the undo is built into the data model. So if you have a data model. Um, where all your objects have like a unique ID or something and you can make uh, you have sort of a transaction based system for putting things into the data model. So you'd be like, oh, I, I did these changes. Here you go. And then you can uh, group all those in an undo scope or something and and throw them uh, into the data model. And then the data model can know what the undo steps are. But having such a data model is essentially like having like a implementing your own database uh, at the back uh, of the game and which is the most time consuming upfront approach of all these but it both is quite easy to work with when you have it uh, like like it, it it's easier to work with than this slightly less easier to work with than this but it's also very robust but it takes a lot of time to do upfront So that's that about undo. So the next item is how to define entities in editor or from code. Now, what I mean about this is that I have this thing here. Let me remove some of these funny tiles. I have, I have this thing here called place entities. And here I can, for example, place, I have this squirrel here that I can place. I can put it somewhere here. Yeah. Save. And now I can go up and talk to this one. And blah blah blah. Uh, I just reset the game there. Uh, so the question is, how do I define these entities in the editor or from code? And I can show both these ideas because I actually have both implemented. So um, I have my editor mode called entity types here, and in here I have uh, I can click new down here, and I can make these different entities. And for example, I have this uh, tree or I have this stump and this stump actually has a collider. I don't know if you can see the yellow box here. I can make like a collider box. So this editor is essentially for choosing, pairing up graphics with a collider. It's for making simple edit entities that need a custom collider or have some kind of animation, such as the waterfall in this case uh, has an animation. So I can set this up within the editor. Uh, so on this, I can choose, is it a static object? Is it an animated object? and then choose the graphics and then if it's animated some settings and then I can also draw a collider like on the stump here. Uh, so I use this for defining simple entities that just need graphics but they don't have any logic associated with them and that's sort of if you come from a game engine like Unity then you usually put scripts on entities. Uh, or game objects in that case. And that's sort of how everything is structured. So in the editor, you, you put scripts on that. I don't have stuff like that. What I do instead is whenever an entity needs game logic, then, it's, then I don't use this. This is for simple stuff. In that case, I define them from code. So I have this cool thing called entity kind. Oh, we go wrong file, entity kind. And we have a bunch of different, uh, which is just a big enum of all my different entity types, sort of. And then I have this create entity from entity kind and it will, for the squirrel, for example, it says, okay, this is the dialogue this entity will use. It has these many renderables and this is the texture for the renderable. Uh, for some other ones like the waterfall. Uh, oh yeah, so the this is actually the old waterfall. I've actually, 
replaced this one. So this is actually not used anymore. I should remove this. So the one here is actually uses uh, the waterfall uh, entity kind. And it's this stuff. So it has like two renderables, which are both animated because it's uh, it's both this face and then uh, the waterfall behind it. And it says it's interactable and there's an offset for where the, where the interaction point should end up. And some objects also have like a, a handler for if I use try to use an object with them, such as I have the... So for example, over here I have this tree, I teleport myself there. And this tree I can, down here I have a couple of different items. I can select my baseball bat and then I can go up to it and whack it and then it gets angry and all its uh, flower falls off. It's the flower tree for baking. Um, so when I use that item with it, then that must have some kind of logic correct connected to it, right? What happens when you use an item with it? So that's why this one is, uh, this flower tree is defined in code. Uh, so the flower tree is defined here. It has a dialogue name and has three different animations because it has both a face and then the branches, the, the, the trunk and then the, the white stuff here. And it's interactable and it has a custom use item handler, which is the thing that makes it possible to smack it like that. So the use item handler uh, is this one. So in this case, like if I try to whack it with the, it's called mallet here, but it's the baseball bat, then it does some extra stuff here. And then you can uh, do these things to, this is essentially to wire sort of item logic up to different things uh, on the entities. So that's just two ways to define entities. If you're working alone as a programmer and designer at the same time and you like doing things in code, then it can be quite nice to define entities in code and use them from code because otherwise you have to have this kind of uh, assumptions about, okay, this is something defined in the editor, so we must have some kind of connection between data explicitly defined in the editor back to the game code again, right? Uh, which can create this kind of indirection where you always have to go to look in some game data to see which thing is this actually, and then you have to jump back to your game code to see where what it actually is. Uh, so this is quite a nice way to keep it minimalistic and make sure that the flow of the code is uh, easy to understand for a programmer. But if you're more people on the team, say there's a more if you have a designer who wants to sit in the editor more and work, then maybe you need to have shift it slightly to more towards uh, setting things up within the editor. So let's move on to serialization. In the editor, we have the save function. Whenever you in the editor click, uh, I'm going to remove this tile. Whenever you click save, this function is run. Um, <coughs> What this one does is it serializes the whole world and then it from that state it creates a we have for example the planet.cat level it creates this sort of uh, json file this is not this is a simplified json so it's not um, uh, standard compliant it's just to make it easier to edit um, and what you can notice here is that I showed the record undo function before that also serialized the world. This is the same function, so the same serialization used for making undo steps is actually the serialization used for saving, which is nice. We'll have to implement that once. The question then, of course, what does this serialize world thing do? Because serialization is not that simple, right? And uh, yeah, uh, so what it does is, for example, we have what I make is I make a level object in here inside the serialized world thingy. And then I have my serializer, which I init as a writer, and then I tell it to serialize the level. And my serializer is uh, JSON based, uh, but uh, it's sort of, 
based on this idea of like the little big planet serialization style, which means that you only have one function for each thing that both handles writing and reading. So this thing here uh, knows that it has these different fields and uh, so it has tiles and entities is what the level contains and uh, a tile is for example it has an index and an exposition and layer and blah 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 and in the case of the tile index that will in the end when you traverse this uh, hierarchy down to the bottom it will be a, uh, an integer so then it comes to serialize int where uh, it will, if it's writing, it will write into the JSON, and if it's not writing, it will read from the JSON. Uh, you can also implement this style as a binary serializer if you want, so it's not human readable. That will make it much faster. That's how, originally how it was implemented. But as you see here, this uh, only is one function to serialize an int, and depending if it's writing or not, it does different things. And uh, so that's sort of how the whole serialization works, how it in the end can just throw out a JSON uh, object, which I then can write to disk to something like the file I showed before here. Let's move on to using the data in game, reading data and creating a world. You have this data that the editor saved, serialized and saved, how do you use that in the game? And here, I just the first thing I would like to say about this is that it's it's a good idea to even though, like in my case, my editor is part of the game executable, even though that's the case, I don't just go in and edit the world that's currently played, because that one might be in a funny state. Like if I, if I have done things to the world so that there are suddenly entities missing that were ori originally there in the level, and I go in and edit that and then save it, then, you know, those things that are based on my gameplay state might end up in the level and then my level is ruined. So your editor should always edit the original data as it was on disk and save out the data and then your game should read the data from the disk or you can keep it in memory but as long as, as, long as the editor doesn't act directly on the active state of the game then, 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 then you're fine. So that's sort of what the game does. Uh, load level is a function here that takes a level file name and it uh, it will make a JSON parser and parse this uh, whole oh, that's entity types yeah here so it will uh, use a JSON parser to parse the, the level JSON and all that and then when it's done with doing that then it will create the world from the new uh, serialized state that it has read in and this create world function essentially similar to the other one here it it's a reader of the, for the serializer so down here we read the level and we go through all the entities and sort of bring them into the game in the format that we actually want because this is currently what the reader will do for example with regard to we have the tiles again again right so then you will have a big list of tiles ready to use that has all these options, these fields, tile index, x, y, layer, blah, 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 which is, which is the layout of this thing, right? Uh, so that's my tiles. And, uh, <clears throat> and the tiles are so simple that it, can, it doesn't actually have to post process the, whatever the serializer reader spits out it can just clone that and you're done uh, for the entities it has to do some extra stuff because there's some uh, extra things that needs to be done like resolving some entity references and maybe you need to put in some animation so there's a, a whole function called enable world that's run separately from this so you have load level and down here it runs enable world, which is essentially it creates some colliders from the tiles. Uh, so the, the tiles themselves are fine, but then it needs to go through all the tiles and create some colliders. And then it also goes through all the entities that are in the world. And if they're not disabled, then it enables them. Uh, and the this create world is 
built in such a way that it, it only sets up the, the basic state needed. So I can actually use the same concept of a world in the editor. And the editor also uses this one, but it keeps its own world. So it, we don't get that problem I talked about, about the editor changing the, the running game's uh, state. <clears throat> the downside of this thing with having two separate worlds is, of course, if I have uh, some gameplay state, like if I go into this conversation here, I go into editor and I leave it, then I'm suddenly not in the conversation anymore because this thing actually resets the whole game and lo reloads the world. You see that the player stays on a certain position. That's because I used to remember where the player was and make sure to put it back there. But actually it has reset the whole world. This is a problem. I haven't really handled this in my game, but what you could do if you have a data model where everything has IDs and stuff, then what you could do is that you could uh, make sort of check which objects have actually been changed and then you go in and selectively respawn only those. So you don't actually do the whole reset of the level. So you take the um, your new serialized level from the level editor and you put that, uh, you figure out what parts have actually changed and then you only respawn those entities and maybe there's some tiles that have appeared and some are gone and you need to figure that all that out. You can do stuff like that, but it's it's a big, uh, it's a bit of a complexity hazard because it implies that you have perfect IDs for everything and uh, that you really need to make sure that you know what has changed or not. So I don't do that, but it's something you can do. So the next point is homemade versus third party editors. And this is sort of a distinction. Uh, so there's kind of three different kinds of editors that I would like to mention here. So in my game, as you see, I have an editor built into the executable. So in my game, there's an editor here and it's the same as the game. This is, this editor is only for using by me. It's not for shipping with the game. Uh, you can also make editor for the end user where they make levels and stuff. That would also of course then be probably within the game. I mean, there are exceptions like the Valve Hammer editor, you know, it comes separately, for example. But then there is third party editors. So this, this video has been a lot about making homemade editors. There's also third party editors such as, um, I'm gonna bring up a web browser here, such as this one, LDTK and Tiled, this one, for example. Uh, and these level editors are for 2D, of course. For 3D, you more often have, like, I haven't seen that many standalone, separate level editors for 3D. Then people usually go more with a complete game engine. But these level editors, they can, you can say, like, oh, here's my tile set. And then you can maybe inside the editor define entities in some way. And you can place the tiles and the entities, and then it exports some format, maybe it's some JSON or some XML or whatever you want. You can import it into your game, uh, but this level editor sort of dictates the format a bit of that. Uh, and these are used by a lot of people. And this LDTK is actually used by the, is made by the creators of dead cells. For many cases, for many use cases, this kind of editor is actually enough and you can sort of bend it to your will a bit. If you need to do very special things in your game, or maybe your game doesn't play by the rules of this editor perfectly, then maybe you want to make your own. But if you just have something that's perfectly like tile based, grid based like this, and you don't uh, do too much special things in your game, like if your game is mostly consist it's consisting of tiles and then you have entities that are spawned where entities, uh, their game logic is sort of self-contained that you could just spawn them in the game. You can be like, oh, this, this is supposed to be enemy enemy cactus is supposed to be here and then it doesn't need that much extra logic you know inside the game editor then these kind of editors are usually fine like you just need to say where are the tiles and where are the entities and which type are the entities then you're these are you kind of editors are usually completely fine finally i would like to mention reloading assets while working you know i have this tile set here for example and i can boot up a sprite and inside a sprite, I can open my tile set and I can draw something inside one of these, like this one. 
I draw here and then I go to my editor and press F4 and then you saw it appear here. Uh, and I can also do that while the game is playing. Let's see here, let's find a tile that's used somewhere. I can draw straight through all these grass tiles. Red, I just draw red so we see it. Press F4 and then you see it appear there. Now, it's very important to have something like that, some kind of uh, asset reloading because uh, then you can quickly work on art and put it into a game and test things. And the important thing to make this working is usually to make sure that you don't just have pointers to textures floating around everywhere. Instead, you use some kind of handle for textures. So uh, in the case of uh, uh, like my te the textures in my game, I have an asset storage and when you get you can get a texture by a handle and it you can get a texture by a name and then it returns a texture handle which is uh, essentially an index into an array uh, but the important thing here is then then when i press f4 in my game to reload then it can just reload the texture right but uh, all the gameplay code and the editor, they only store the texture handle, which is essentially just index. So it can just replace the data there. So the next time it comes around to using that, then it will all be fine. If you had like pointers to textures, then you're in trouble, right? Because maybe you reload the texture, so you would need to replace, like your editor code doesn't know uh, that this texture has changed and maybe it will even use uh, invalid memory and you're in all kinds of pain. So having some kind of indirection like uh, these kind of handles is a good idea, I would say. Yeah, uh, that's all I had for this video. If you have any specific questions or ideas on how to make level editors or any kind of game tools, then please let me know and uh, thank you for watching i'll see you next video bye bye